Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures, and we pray that as we think about them together, that you might be at work here in our hearts and our minds and our hearing and in our understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Americans, there's virtually no statement we can make that we would take more pride in than this one. I've worked for everything I have. There's almost nothing that we can say that means more to us than that. I think I was about eight years old when my father first encouraged me to start working for him. He had uh, in the garage, he had a little wood shop, and he would make things there, and we would sell them. And when he was done with a job, I think I was eight, and he would say to me, okay, I'll pay you, go clean up the workshop, right? And that's how I started working for him. And I worked for him, you know, every Saturday, all through pretty much from the time that I was in eighth grade and the time that I graduated from high school. Work ethic is something that is impressed on us really at every turn, everywhere we look. That's the thing that we hear is people saying, people don't want to work anymore, right? Which is a whole other sermon. But the fact that we say that and hear that so often just points to this idea about how much we value work. So it's no surprise that a fair number of Americans will actually identify God helps those who help themselves as being one of the Ten Commandments. There's a surprising number of people who think that you can find that quote in the Bible. In fact, if you go to Google and you know how you do the type ahead feature and you kind of see what it is that people are Googling around a certain thing, when you put that in, God helps those who help themselves, the first thing that comes up is in the Bible, right? That's the thing that comes up. So people are convinced that it's there, but it's not. It's really a saying that goes back to ancient Greece. And it evolved in different permutations, but the Americanized version is really from, as you might imagine, who would you guess? Ben Franklin, right, exactly. Poor Richard's Almanac. 1736. Now, this passage from 2 Thessalonians is about as close as we get to finding something like it. And in fact, it actually takes God helps those who help themselves and makes it even harsher, right? When it says, if anyone doesn't want to work, they shouldn't eat. So the scripture does seem pretty clear on this. So you might be asking yourself at this point, well, preacher, why is it that you're saying this is a half-truth? Well, let's start by talking about this in context, because there's always more to the story. When you read the scripture, it's not just that one verse. It's really about, okay, what is the situation that we're trying to address here? And Paul had started this church in Thessalonica during his second missionary journey, probably around 50 AD. It was his second trip around the Mediterranean where he was stopping in different places and spending time in different cities and founding churches there. So when he passed through an area, he would preach the gospel. And sometimes the gospel would take and a community would form. And this is one of the churches that he left behind. And you can read about it in Acts 17 if you want to know the backstory of that. But the church at Thessalonica seems to have had some unique kinds of folks in it people who are just a little tough to work with. And in fact, if you read this scripture in different translations, verse 6, where the translation that we read talks about living undisciplined lives, you can find other translations that say uh, disorderly lives, or idle, talks about uh, walking in idleness. So depending on the translation, you get this range of ideas about what was actually happening there. And in particular, we believe this because of other things that are in First and Second Thessalonians. The community seems to have been really hung up on the idea that Jesus was coming again very soon, like imminently. Now, that's not an uncommon thing for people to express faith in throughout the New Testament. But in this particular instance, it seems to have taken root in such a way that 
people were actually quitting their jobs and just waiting around for Jesus to show up. And so that's what Paul is trying to address when he writes and says, those who don't want to work shouldn't eat. He's trying to address this idea that, you know, people out of a misunderstanding of what faith would require in a certain moment are doing something that's putting a burden on the community. And why are you doing that? This doesn't make any sense. So whether or not that's really a command for all time is really debatable under those circumstances. Paul was trying to deal with a specific thing. It was happening there. I mean, I don't really, you know, blame people who are totally convicted of that idea that Christ is coming against it. If we're, if we're going to be my last day on earth, I love my job, but I wouldn't be coming into the office, right? I mean, you wouldn't either. So I can kind of get it. But at the same time, the burden that it was placing on the community was more than Paul felt was appropriate in this circumstance. So the connection between faith and work this is one that's been important through time. Actually, uh, the first monastic order, okay, the Benedictines. So there's a famous ancient Christian writing called the Rule of St. Benedict. And it's kind of the basis around which many monastic communities were formed. And the Rule of St. Benedict had as part of its kind of founding slogans, this idea of aura, et labora. So in Latin, pray and work. Ora et labora. And so that was the basic rule of life. You worked during the day. You paused maybe up to seven times a day for prayer. And as a result of this, throughout Europe, monasteries became places of actually great wealth. So much so that during Henry VIII's time, he saw this as a prime opportunity. And so one of Henry VIII's um, steps to claim the church for himself was actually to dissolve the monasteries because they were sources of such great wealth. So all of us know that spiritually and practically, every aspect of our lives requires some degree of work in order to be fruitful. That's what Kelsey was talking about with the kids today. We don't just pray for good relationships. We, we put the effort in. I don't want to say we work at them because I think that that also puts us maybe into a bad understanding of what a relationship is about because there's a seriousness implied in work that I don't think is really applicable to relationships. But it does take an investment, an investment of time and effort, investments of kindness, investments of energy and generosity, we don't just pray for a job. If you want a job, you've got to put together your resume. You've got to do the work, the research. You've got to make the connections. You've got to do the interviewing. There's no way around those steps if you want a job. You can't just pray and expect that tomorrow you're going to be hired. Every area of our lives requires something from us. So prayer is good, but prayer alone is not going to cut it. Ora et labora. So where does this half-truth come in then? Well, not everyone can help themselves. That's just a reality. Not everyone can help themselves. And there comes a time in every one of our lives when we can't help ourselves whether it's because of something that we're going through physically, whether it's because of something that we're going through emotionally, spiritually, financially, there comes a moment when all of us need help, when we can't help ourselves. I've tried more times than I can count since I've been in ministry to try and help people who are in difficult financial circumstances get back on their feet. And what I've learned in that process 
is that it's not just one thing that keeps people where they are. Most of us have enough margin in our lives, financially, time-wise, in terms of relationships and resources, that we take for granted that we can get our housing situation, our childcare situation, our communication situation, our transportation situation, our healthcare situation, our job situation, we can get all those things to line up so that they all work. And we stay at a steady state and we can kind of pay our bills and kind of keep going in life. But the reality is for many people, there's just not anywhere near that kind of margin. So that if any one of those things breaks down, even a little, even for a short period of time, that can create a domino effect that eventually leads somebody to being homeless. So, I mean, your kid is sick. If your kid is sick, you gotta keep him out of daycare. If you keep the kid out of daycare and you don't have family around to pick up the slack, well, guess who stays home? Say you're a single person. You stay home, maybe you don't get paid. You don't get paid, maybe some bills start to slip by you, like your cell phone bill. You don't pay your cell phone. Now your employer can't get a hold of you and tell you when you're scheduled to work. Now, because you didn't pay your cell phone bill, now you're out of a job. Because you're out of a job, now, suddenly, the landlord is putting eviction notices on your door. It's this cycle. One little thing breaks, and a whole series of things can follow. Not everyone can help themselves. It's just the reality, and I've seen it over and over again. And so for me, this is where the saying that God helps those who help themselves begins to break down. Because the situation that I just described is not one where someone doesn't want to work. The situation that I just described is someone who finds themselves caught up in something that's beyond their ability to deal with. And as a result, ends up losing perhaps everything. And that's why, you know, this fall, this program Bridges of Hope that we were talking about last week that we're working with Christian Caring Center to fund, this idea of people coming alongside those who are facing homelessness and working their way back to being in a place of their own, it's really, really important because people just don't have the support network, the robust support network, in order to have people walk beside them to get them back on their feet. And that's what this program is designed to provide. So we're going to continue to be talking about that and continue to be raising money for it. But it's in these kinds of circumstances that we would expect more than just kind of a quid pro quo, where I put something in and the universe, God, the world gives me something back that's equal to what I put in. We need something more than just the idea that we're exchanging work for a blessing. Because what good is that? If everything that we have is just the stuff that we worked for, then I start to think about this time. It's one of the early episodes of The Simpsons. And some of you will know where this is going. Bart is asked to say grace over the meal. And as he sits down to pray, he says, we paid for all this stuff ourselves. So thanks for nothing. I mean, that's where it ends up. If you continue this idea of, well, everything that you've worked for, you've got to earn. It ends up there with the thought that this is just what I deserve. But that's not really what our faith is based in. That's exactly not the point. 
because when we sit down to say grace, it is exactly what the name of that action implies. We're sitting down to say, thank you for all the things that I received that I did not deserve along the way. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, if you ever received an unexpected financial blessing. And it might have been a small thing. I see small things like this happen in my life all the time. You know, where maybe you took the car in to the shop and you had maybe, you know, $700 budgeted for it. But here's the reality. You know, the bill's going to come back at $1,000, $1,100. But then you think about this last week, you got that check for $300 from a place that you didn't expect. And you say, well, I guess that worked out. Those kinds of things have happened in my life more often than I can remember. And I'm grateful for it. But that's what we're talking about, this idea that what happens with our finances is what happens with our spiritual lives too. That we receive many, many things that we did not work for. That's the whole point. We did not work for the thing that God did for us on the cross. We did not work for that. We did not work for that forgiveness. And that's why we talk about grace. Yes, we can find all kinds of passages throughout the Bible about the value of hard work. But we can find a lot more passages about how God helps those who can't help themselves. Why do we name hospitals, Good Samaritan Hospital. Isn't the Good Samaritan the example of grace in someone's life? I mean, how do you expect the guy who's left for dead along the side of the road to help himself? That's not how this works. So the story of our faith is not about what we've earned. The story of our faith is about what has been freely given to us by God and how we take all the things that God has blessed us with and we use those to bless someone else when they're going through it. That's the reality of what we're called to do as Christians. It's not that we're not supposed to work hard, but we work hard with the expectation that when God blesses us, when those blessings are above and beyond anything that we could have earned, that we share them, that we come alongside someone else. Because there are times when we can't help ourselves. And that's why we believe in grace. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for the gift of grace. We know that you call us to work hard, to prepare, to be wise, to apply ourselves. But we also know that each and every one of us goes through a time. If we haven't been there already, when we can't, do for ourselves. And in those instances, remind us of your grace and help us to be conduits of that grace into the lives of those that we meet who are going through it. We pray these things in Jesus' name.